And good morning to those, uh, the church family that's joining us in the Fellowship Hall. Great to have you guys with us as well. And those that are joining online, great to have you, church, uh, wherever you are, whether you're in the sanctuary, in the Fellowship Hall, or joining us online. Uh, hopefully you saw the bulletins that are kind of spread out in the different locations here at the church. We also have an online copy if you'd like to grab one of those or uh, access that. You can do so on the uh, church website. And uh, pretty much the only announcement I'm going to uh, bring to your attention is this Wednesday, uh, AMPT will start meeting again. They will be meeting outside at this time weather permitting, and uh, just kind of looking to get back this Wednesday, catch up on some things. Coach Carter will talk about a little bit, uh, give a little Bible lesson, but uh, mostly just kind of a, a time to get back together. And then the following Wednesday, having a midsummer bash, if you will, and uh, kind of a, a welcome, an official welcome to the new seventh graders. And uh, all of the new seventh graders will get a new Amped t-shirt. And then They'll also be giving away uh, special gifts for the graduates. And uh, so kind of let you know about that and then have some pizza and some other things going on uh, two Wednesdays from now. Those of you that are here on site, uh, you probably saw these spread out. We had a generous donation specifically given for these uh, and with the request that we order two different sizes. So there are adult sizes on the little table there in the lobby as well as at the Connection Center. And then we also have some in the Fellowship Hall on the counter. And then there are children's sizes, youth size, that are available on the little table, the little uh, clubhouse table there going into the cafe. And there are also some back in the Fellowship Hall. And so just, again, those are there for you. Um, if you wanna grab one and when you have to go in for your shopping, grocery shopping or whatever, and throw one of those on and represent King Wesleyan Church. Again, we appreciate the generous donation that made those possible. Yeah, you can clap for that. Uh, how, how many of you like mysteries? A few of you? How, how many of you don't like a mystery? You like, just... I just, I want it all out there, right? I actually, I enjoy mysteries. My wife and I, uh, we enjoy reading mysteries together. Uh, that's one of the ways that I, I can relax, but also a way that we can bond together and spend some, some time together is reading a mystery, and we kind of stop after a chapter or whatever, and like, so who do you think did it? What's going on? And uh, a variety of Christian, minist uh, Christian mystery writers that are out there, and so we'll read those, and, and there are times when I, I'm, you know, not to toot my own horn, but beep, beep, um, I'm pretty good at guessing who it is uh, fairly early on, like, I, I think it's this one, and can tag it, and then there are other times it's like, I have no clue, and then obviously there are times when I think I know who it is, and then later on I find out I was completely wrong, but usually you get to the end of the book and the mystery's revealed, and the good writer is, are the ones that I can't figure it out until the end. But then once they reveal who the, the suspect was, you're able to go back to the previous chapters and you go, oh, this makes sense. And you start connecting the dots and it all fits together and you're like, oh, I should have seen that. It was, it was there, but it was... It was concealed. I couldn't quite see it. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is going to talk to us about as we look at Ephesians chapter 3, as we continue our study of Rooted, where we're looking to grow deeper and live stronger as we walk through, journey through this book of Ephesians, a great book, one of my favorite books in the Bible. But he's going to talk about this mystery and how it's been revealed. And so if you have your Bibles, love for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. I'm going to pause right there 
because there's, there's quite a bit here, and this, this is actually is just bonus, okay? This isn't really the message today or anything. This isn't the theme of what Paul's going to talk about in these 13 verses that we're going to look at. It's not what I'm going to go after today, but yet there is something here that I think is worth us just pausing and taking a look at and going, hmm, what if? Here's, here's what I'm talking about. So for this reason, I, so he's setting up what he's about to say, what he's about to cover, but then he says, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, and it might be easy to just read over that, like, well, we want to get to the good stuff. Pastor talked about a mystery, but before we get to the mystery, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, he is a prisoner, but he's a prisoner of Rome, but that's not how he sees things. That's not how he's looking at things that's not how he's projecting things he's looking at at it from a different perspective whatever he does whatever is going on it's for Christ and so if he's a prisoner he's a prisoner for Christ different perspective isn't it when you think of your circumstances through the lens of your relationship with Jesus Christ instead of just deciding to have a self-pity party. It could have been easy for Paul to say, I'm in prison, what is this all about? Hey, you guys pray that I get out of here. It's all your fault. But that's not what he says. It's, there's a purpose. I'm in prison, but I'm not a prisoner of Rome. Yes, technically I am, but, but I see it as I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus and it's for your sake. Here's the the what if. I I want you to just think about. What if we would see our circumstances as something that God could use for his purpose? What if we could see our pain as something that God would use for others' gain? What if, instead of deciding to have a self-pity party, what if we would see our pain whatever we may be going through, as something that God could use for others' gain. That's what Paul is saying. I'm in prison, but you know what? It's for your glory. I'm trusting, and I'm seeing that God is going to use what I'm going through for your glory. My pain for your gain. We we have uh, the saying, different um, fitness centers and stuff, not that I've ever been in one, but different fitness centers have the saying and locker rooms and stuff like that, no pain, no gain, right? And it's usually talking about yourself, but what if we could see that sometimes our pain is for the gain of someone else? And isn't that the way of Christ? It's not necessarily the way of Western civilization, but it's the way of Christ. What if we could see our pain as God using that for somebody else's gain? Just a, like I said, a little side note, a little bonus. I'm feeling giving this morning. But now I want to turn your attention to this dash. Usually I'll highlight a, a word or, or a phrase. But occasionally there's a punctuation. There's a dash or a question mark or an exclamation point that is worthy of us to paying attention to. There's one here in verse 1 which indicates and the, the, the writers and the different translators as they've put scripture together and they've taken it from the original text and translated it, it into English for our sake. They notice as they're going along like Paul just kind of stops. He's like mid-sentence, he's talking about something, he's got a thought, he's going a certain direction, and then he just kind of switches streams on us. Does, do any of you talk like that? Or maybe do you know others that talk like that? It's like, I thought we were talking about this, and now all of a sudden you're, you're over here. What happened? And you've got conversation whiplash? That, that's almost what takes place here, but we can start to understand Paul starts thinking of this whole idea of for the sake of the Gentiles, his purpose in life, his calling in life. And in particular, its relation 
to the Gentiles, how it relates to the Gentiles. And so Paul's going to pick back up on this where he started in verse 1. He's going to pick back up on that in verse 14, and we'll pick up on that next week, Lord willing. But what we're going to look at today is where the sidetrack kind of that Paul goes after, and, and we trust that this was Holy Spirit directed, that the Holy Spirit just started working on. Paul's just starting to write down. He's like, okay, God, you, this is what you want me to write to the church. And, and then he starts having this thought, and the Holy Spirit's like, yep, run with that, buddy. Run with that, because they need to see what, what you're thinking, what I'm leading in you. And so let's pick it up, verse 2. He says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. So he's like, you, you know what? We've talked about this, and so the, the mystery is not really new to you. We've, we've talked about it. I haven't called it a mystery, but, but what is the mystery isn't really new to you. I've talked about it. You could go back and, and read my previous post, or you could go back and catch it on YouTube or something. But, but if we talked about it a little bit, but let's go in a little bit deeper. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. We're going to keep going. Verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I'm going to just pause there for just a little bit so we can understand this mystery. First of all, it's important that we understand that the mystery wasn't something that Paul uncovered or something that Paul discovered the mystery was something that God revealed to him. When, when Paul previously, he was Saul, and he, he went out persecuting those who were following Christ. He was against those who were following Christ. He was the Jew of Jews. And he took personal responsibility to go out and to squelch, try to squelch anything that had to do with Jesus Christ. And then he's on the road to Damascus, and many of you are familiar with this account. He's on the road to Damascus, and then there's this blinding light, the resurrected Jesus, after his ascension, has this encounter with Paul, then Saul, and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul becomes blinded, and ends up going to a disciple's house where they have a discussion and he starts understanding who Jesus is more and more and his eyes are opened not just physically but spiritually because God reveals this mystery. Something that had been hidden through the ages. Now there are hints, there are clues there were things dropped along the way, dots, if you will, that could be connected, but they couldn't be connected until God revealed it in the right time. And so Paul has this revelation from God. The light bulb goes off, and Paul starts connecting the dots. Like going back to Abraham, when, when God had the encounter with Abraham and gave him these promises and they had the, the covenant that God would make him into a great nation and that through him all nations would be blessed. Well, the, the Jews, of course, the Israelites, they, they pick up on that. And like, yeah, we're going to be a blessed nation. And they, they are blinded to that second part of that, that follow-up that, that through you all nations will be blessed. They, they become blinded to scripture like in Isaiah that talks about the suffering servant who would take on the iniquities of us all and that by his stripes we would be healed and they just took that as that was just for the Jews. And then even when Jesus came and said in the most quoted verse, well, 
has been the most quoted verse, although I'm not sure where we're at exactly right now, but typically the most quoted verse, the most well-known verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever or whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? Well, the Jews like, hey, yeah, that's right. We're in. That's for us. But they fail to understand until there's the eyes are open. They're like, oh, when he said, for God so loved the world, he wasn't just talking about the world of Jews. He's talking about the, the, the world. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Gentiles are those that are from another nation. The, the word that's used actually for Gentile is the word that we get translated ethnicities. So there's the Jews, and then there's the, all these other ethnicities. It didn't matter what you were, where you were from, you were either a Jew or you were a Gentile. And all of a sudden, Paul now sees that Jesus came not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. Paul now understands that the message, the gospel message, isn't just for the Jew and oh well, you know what because they don't believe because many of them rejected it now we'll go ahead and take it out to the Gentiles because you know well Jesus died so he might as well have died for a reason the Jews don't seem to really want to have a lot to do with Jesus overall we might as well include the Gentiles we've got leftovers so you know what you get leftover Jesus hey happy birthday to you Paul says no I now see that the Gentiles were part of God's plan, saving plan, redeeming plan, all along. That's the mystery, that uh, through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. They get the same inheritance. Members together of one body, which we talked about last week, Jew and Gentile, and in Christ, they're brought together and shares together in the promise of God. So they are now one. Verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, our, our ears should go up a little bit. He's talking about us. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This is really rich, and I'm, I'm not going to take the time that that this passage completely warrants. But I want us to see a couple things. As we look at this verse, one of the words that stands out to me is manifold. Now, some of you, when you hear manifold, you're thinking car parts, and you're going, <laughs> you know. Manifold is this idea of multifaceted. You kind of think of a, a diamond, a, pr a prism. You think of light shining off of that prism and, and the, the variety of colors that come from that. So, so when Paul uses the word that we have manifold here, the, the word that, or the thought that they have is, is this multicolored fabric, a, a, a multicolored picture. They're, they're looking at seeing how God's grace, God's wisdom fits every single thing. Like there are outfits, like there's a top, uh, ladies especially, you know, you pick a top and like, okay, I've got to find something that will match that top. And there are certain tops that you, like, that you would wear that won't match everything. But then there are some tops like, that pretty much will go with anything because it's got almost any color or every color in it. Like, we, we can, I can work with that. And the, the idea here is that God's wisdom, his manifold wisdom, we also can understand this as his grace. It fits every situation. God's grace meets us wherever we're at. 
His wisdom is there for us no matter the situation. That God, that God knew what he was doing. Imagine that. And he's saying, so Paul's saying, so we just want you to see, God's had this plan all along, and it's showcased, it's, it's the, like, the picture that lets us see it is how God provided grace for the Jew and for the Gentile. Then I want you to see how Paul takes us that there was a chain of events, okay? The first chain was that Jesus revealed the mystery. God revealed the mystery to Paul. Paul understood that Jesus came, that God loved the Jew and the Gentile, that Jesus died for the Jew and for the Gentile, that it's only in Christ that we can be saved, whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile. We all go through, we all only get to heaven through the cross. And so Paul understands that. The mystery's been revealed. He says, and it's been given to me to give to the Gentiles. So I'm passing it on to you guys. And so he said, here it is. Here's the mystery. But then he says, did you catch this? I said, our ears should pick up, perk up. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to who? The rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Who is that? Or who be they? Angels, most likely fallen angels. If we follow Paul's train of thought and as the Spirit's directing him, as he writes Ephesians and we look at the whole book and we take into context what is being written, I think it's fair to assume that Paul is talking here about something he's going to talk about later in Ephesians chapter 6 as the Holy Spirit directs him and says, now let's talk about spiritual warfare. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Even though sometimes it really feels that way, doesn't it, church? So, but our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the what? Against the rulers and principalities and spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And so he, Paul's saying, here's the thing. Jesus revealed this to me. I'm revealing it to, to you, the Gentiles. And you, the church, you get to reveal it to the heavenly realms. The rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. We have a message for the demons. Is that, I don't know, what is that, what is that spark in you? Does that spark in like, yeah, we got a message! Like, or is it like, um, what's the message? What are we supposed to tell them? Uh, let me just ask you it this way, what do you think we're telling them? As the church, capital C, let's just start there, so, big scope, all of those who are in Christ, what do you think the message to those in the heavenly realms is lately? Now, now let's bring it back down, and, and let's focus on Kingston Wesleyan Church, but let's bring it down even more so, because you're the church. What message have you been sending by the way you've been living? What message are you sending to those that are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. That's pretty sobering when I think about it. That here's this great responsibility that, that God wants the church to shine so brightly and be a beacon of his love and his grace to exemplify what it, mean, what it looks like for Jews and Gentiles to, to be a part of one body. that instead of allowing the things that have be, been divisive over years and years and years and years, that the gospel message so changes lives that the ones that were separate from one another, how they, they were far apart 
One, one had nothing to do with the other. The Jew looked at the Gentile and said, I'd rather be a dog than be a Gentile. But then in Christ, they're brought together so that the Jew loves the Gentile as the Jew would love another Jew. And there is no more division between them. Because Christ, as we saw earlier in chapter 2, had broken down, had destroyed the wall of hostility. And so now they are one in Christ Jesus. And the message that that sends to the heavenly realms is you can't stop us when Christ is in us. Because we are better together. We love one another. We're not going to allow the differences to separate us anymore because we are in Christ. So again, I ask you, what message are you sending to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Verse 11. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I'm going to focus in on verse 12 in just a moment, but I want to keep going to verse 13. He says, and we conclude this section, I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Doesn't that sound a lot like where he started in verse 1? It takes us back to the what if. What if we could see our pain as something that God would use for others' gain? And so with verse 13, Paul basically comes back to where he had started with verse 1, and then we'll pick it up in verse 14. But since Paul brought up this great passage in verse 12, this great idea of prayer in verse 12, I want us to spend some time on that. But before we do that, I want to share just a, a short video from VBX. Uh, as some of you know, we had VBX, Vacation Bible Extreme, this last week, and it was different than any one we've ever done before because we did it virtually. And I was pretty impressed. I was pretty pleased. We had almost 50 students that participated, representing 25 families. Some were able to participate uh, with, with uh, more participation as far as they have the internet and they were able to access uh, uh, the live group finales on uh, the evenings and stuff like that and, and maybe get into a little bit more. But different ones were involved. And I loved seeing the different pictures and videos that were sent in of parents leading their children through Vacation Bible Extreme. Not just parents dropping their kids off at Kingston Wesleyan Church, then going off and then coming back and picking them up a couple hours later and, hey, all right, guys, hope you had fun tonight. Go home, go to bed, blah, blah, blah. Don't really talk about it. Don't, don't really know what was going on. Don't know what was being taught or anything like that. But parents actually getting to engage, be engaged in a spiritual lesson with their children. It made it one of my favorite VBXs ever. And one of the reasons why I was so high on VBX 2020 was because of this video right here. This is Levi. And did you see Levi's excitement in what was going on? Did you see the, the big smile on his face? And he's like doing the happy dance because this blow dryer has a ping pong ball hovering in the air. He is, he's thrilled. And did you see dad's face? Dad's like, this is awesome. Watching my son and, and we're having this, this lesson. There was, there was a point behind this exercise. The, the blow dryer is putting out the air, right, to make the, the ping pong ball hover. You can't see the air between the, the hair dryer and the ping pong ball, but you can see the effect of the air between the, the blow dryer and the ping pong ball. We talked about faith. And on night one, we talked about believing in, or 
that we can focus on what we can't see because as we focus on what we can't see, we can believe in what we can't see because of what we can see and how there's evidence of God all around us. And so Levi and his dad are going through this lesson and we, get the, we see the excitement. And here's the, the point that I want to make. When it comes to prayer, are we anything like Levi? When we think of this mystery, because Paul's connecting prayer to the mystery. Like, we have access to the throne of God. Do you understand that? Which, by the way, that's point number one. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Jesus gives us direct access to God. Paul's saying, I want us to understand this mystery. As we unpack this mystery, that Jesus came not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile, that all could have a relationship with God in Christ Jesus. That we now, we, the, the, the curtain was split. That what used to be a dividing wall of hostility, that's no longer there. But not only that, understand Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles were even more limited on being able to go into the presence of God. They were stuck in the outer courts. The Jews were limited how far they could go. Only the, the priest, the high priest, could actually go into the Holy of Holies, go before the presence of God. What we would look at as prayer, communion with God. But now in Christ Jesus, as Christ was crucified on the cross, and as he breathed his last breath, the curtain was separated. It was torn in two, representing, giving the idea, the understanding that in Christ Jesus, we all have access, direct access to God. So you don't need the pastor to say your prayers for you. I'm honored to join you in prayer, but you don't need me to pray your prayers. I think there's great benefit in multiple people coming together in agreement in prayer, but you get to go, you have direct access in Christ Jesus to the throne of God. That should just leave you going, amazing. That should leave us with the excitement like Levi had when he was seeing that ping pong ball hover above that blow dryer. Sadly, unfortunately, I think too often we approach prayer as if it's just another to-do on our list of things to do. This is what we're supposed to do instead of this is what we get to do. Instead of, isn't this amazing? I have direct access to the throne of God. Pretty amazing to me. The second thing that I want us to see from this is when you pray to God, speak freely. The NIV has it that we can come, that we may approach God with freedom. Some translations say boldness here. I like freedom uh, because it's, it gives to me a little better context of what the Apostle Paul, I believe, was implying. Um, some of you remember the days back in the day um, where we didn't have cell phones, really. We had landlines, and if you wanted to make a long-distance call, you probably wanted to do it after hours or on the weekend because it was cheaper then. And even then... At least the way it was in my home, well, there was usually kind of a time limit. Like, you, you've got about 10 minutes, and then you better be off, because that is, that's uh, accumulating every minute, right? And even with cell phones, and maybe some of you have uh, cell phone plans where you're limited. A lot of plans anymore have unlimited uh, talk anyway, talk and text. But there's some that, that have uh, the phone cards, and like, like, you know what, I'm going to call you, but then you call me back or whatever. And when we put it on somebody else's dime, you know how that goes sometimes. Or, or when it is yours, you're limited anyway. And so it's like, we, we've got to make it short. And so you like almost have to come up with code so, so you can just get everything in in a short amount of time. But when it comes to prayer, God, Paul's saying, you know what, it's not like Twitter. It's not 144 characters or less. You can come with freedom 
God's got all the time in the world for you. Talk to him. Come with freedom. When, when Paul's saying that we may approach him with freedom, Paul's saying you can talk about anything. There's nothing off limits in your conversation with God. You can tell God when you're frustrated. You can tell God when you're sad. You can tell God when you're happy. There's, there's nothing off limits. You can tell God when you just, you're like, I, I don't understand God. I don't understand what, what they're doing. I don't understand what, what's going on. I don't understand what you're doing. You can talk with, with freedom. Much like, if you think about it, there are relationships that we have where you feel freedom. It's like we, and you might even say, we, we can talk about anything. I can share everything with them. I trust them, which is what this is based on, like freedom. I, I trust him, that he can handle, that, that whatever I need to say, whatever's on my heart, that, 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 I, that he'll listen, that he cares. I've got freedom. I can talk about anything. But then we also know that there are relationships where things are pretty compartmentalized, Things are pretty guarded. You know that if you share certain things about what you're thinking, about what's going on, about what you've done, it can and it will be used against you. Not just in the court of law, right? Because there are certain relationships that are like that. And you just know from history, like, there is not freedom in this relationship to really share my heart. We can talk about the weather. We might be able to talk about uh, the tigers, but we're not going to talk politics. We're not going to talk about relationship with God. We're not going to talk about my, my fears or my failures or my doubts or any of that. That's off limits because I know it can and will be used against me. But not so with the Lord. There's freedom in our conversation with the Lord. Now, let, let me just give kind of a caveat to that. Do keep in mind that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do keep in mind that he is holy, that he is above all others. And so do keep in mind that there's still this need to come to him with, with reverence, with respect. But certainly there is freedom in our conversation with the Lord. One of the reasons why I like freedom better than boldness is boldness can kind of give the idea of brashness depending on one's understanding and boldness as Paul is using it here is not brashness it's not this going before the throne and saying God this is what you're going to do you're going to do this this and this like we're not in that position we don't have that freedom okay we have the freedom to talk to God we have the freedom to share what's going on in our heart but we don't have the freedom to tell God what to do okay so just understanding there is a, a difference there that we talk to God honestly we can talk to God about whatever um, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 Paul's going to later pick back up on this idea of prayer and so we'll also pick back up a little bit more on this idea of prayer later on in chapter 6 but I do want to share, share quickly Paul says pray in the spirit at all times with every kind of prayer and petition I love that every kind of prayer like variety of prayer you know, we talked about this at VBX. One of the days um, was, was you can pray anytime, <laughs> anywhere, about anything. And, and that's what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Pray in the Spirit at all times with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. So you can pray, speak, you can pray. Uh, when you pray to God, speak freely. You can pray about anything. You can talk to God about anything and everything. The third and final thing that I will pull from what Paul just shared with us about prayer is pray it like you mean it. Pray it like you mean it. Paul says to pray with confidence. So we pray it like we mean it. We get... <laughs> Lord, I know you can. Not, not Lord, if, if you can heal this person, would you? Lord, you can. 
Now, we can throw out, and I think it's uh, biblical to, to say, Lord, according to your will in Christ Jesus, according to your perfect will, would you do this? I, I know you can, so there's this confidence you can, because here's the two things. There's two things that, that are at the, the root of our confidence in prayer. One, we know that God is good, right? God is good all the time. And so when we go to God in prayer, we go to God in prayer knowing that God is good all the time. And so we have confidence that when we pray, God is good all the time. We also, when we go to prayer, we have confidence not just that God is good, but we have confidence that God is great. And so when we go to prayer, God, God in prayer, we, we pray with confidence because God is good, but we also know that God is great. And so we say, God, you can do this, and I know that you will do what is best, even when we don't understand it, even when I don't see it at this point. Because we know just like Christ was a mystery for thousands of years, it's possible that the answer to our prayer will remain a mystery. How is this going to turn out, Lord, for my good or their good? And how is this going to turn out for your glory? Sometimes we have to just by faith trust because we go to God in confidence, knowing that he is good and that he is great, that even though we don't understand his, his timing or what he chooses to do, that he is good and he is great and that that mystery will be revealed at some point. It may not be until eternity, but at some point we will truly see that God fulfilled everything in Christ Jesus. He answered that prayer because he is good and he is great. It wasn't maybe according to the way we wanted it answered, but he was true to himself. And he ultimately was true to our prayer, our confidence that he is good and that he's great. So pray it like you mean it. As the praise team comes to lead us in a couple songs, as they prepare, I, I just would encourage you to spend some time in prayer. And maybe you just need to recapture the awe. The awe of this wonderful ability in Christ Jesus that we have to access God. Direct access to God. Maybe for you, it's just the encouragement that you need to, to pray freely. That there's some things that you've had bottled up and you just need to, like, Lord, I need your help with this. I need to just tell you about this. I need to talk to you about this. And maybe for you, there's a need to come to the Lord with, with confidence and pray it like you mean it. You've been kind of beating around the bush with something. You've been praying it, but there's been some doubt Maybe it's based on his goodness. Maybe you've been disappointed in the past. And so your prayers haven't been filled with confidence because you haven't really been trusting his goodness. But as you look back on your prayer time in the past, and this is what I would encourage you to do, and then I'm going to pray, just give you some time in prayer, and praise team will lead us. What was your last answered prayer? What is your last answered prayer? prayer. I sure hope that it's bigger and more specific than Lord bless this food to our bodies. Amen. Although we should be thankful for our health and all of that. But what's your last answered prayer? Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have this wonderful access to the throne. Amazing that you would hear us. That, 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 you, would, that you would care about me. 
that you would care about my thoughts, my feelings, my pain, my, my joy. Thank you. Thank you that we can come before you with freedom, that we can talk about anything and everything that you care. And Lord, thank you that you are good and you are great, that you do answer prayer, that we can pray with confidence, knowing that a loving God, powerful God, answers prayers. And so, Lord, may you hear the prayers of your people. May we pray bold prayers. May we pray prayers that align with your heart. May, may we pray prayers that are focused on others and not just ourselves. May we pray prayers that are about the kingdom of God. Seeing one another unified in Christ and sending a message to the world. And we'll give you the honor and the glory. 